<laughs> good morning. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of ShmooCon. Uh, you are in the Bring It On track, so if you're looking for one of the other tracks. That was, I guess that was a good 10 a.m. Saturday a clap. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so our first uh, talk, so sorry, one, one quick uh, announcement. Uh, so 11 a.m., uh, they will be selling some old swag uh, in the Reg Room. So if you want to pick up any of the old stuff from ShmooCon, any of that cool stuff, um, check them out after this talk uh, over in the Reg Room. Um, T-shirt sales will, are going on right now as well. So again, feel free to head over. Um, Hackers Lounge will be going on again upstairs today. Um, so you can grab something quick to eat for lunch. Or again, the bar area will be open up starting about 5 p.m. So, our first uh, speakers here, we have Brian David Johnson and Natalie Venata. Um, and this talk is actually pretty neat. Um, I, when we heard about it, it was kind of neat. You know, it's one of those things like they're, they, they talk, they're supposed to be talking about here a little bit about, you know, what, how do you think about the future? You know, and I don't know if they have a, um, you know, if they're time travelers or what, but hopefully we can get a little insight into, you know, how you can think about the future. So, take it away. Thank you. So good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so we'd first like to say thank you to the Potters and the search committee for letting us uh, get up here on stage and speak. Both me and Brian are first time Shmoo speakers, so we're uber excited. Super excited to be here. And this actually is Brian's very first time even attending ShmooCon. Yay! So what we're going to be talking about today is our ongoing research in this idea of exploring the future. And so, as a nod to all of our lawyers, we first have to start with a standard disclaimer. What we're talking about is absolutely me and Brian's own opinions based on our own research and in no way, shape, form should be considered the official policy of our employers, uh, even if it's sometimes we think it should be. But it's not their official policy. And so, what are you going to take away uh, from this talk this morning? And that is, is that everyone has a role to play. And so we're going to talk about some of the key takeaways. We came from this pilot that we did in August. Uh, we're going to talk about the next iteration of our work that we're going to be doing in May and how you can influence and how you can participate in it. Because if nothing else, we realize the deeper uh, we get into this, we realize so many more people need to be part of this conversation, and that means you. So if we're going to create a relationship from you to me and us to you, maybe we should introduce ourselves. So hey everybody, I'm Brian David Johnson. I am a futurist. I'm the futurist in residence at Arizona State University. I'm also a fellow at uh, Frost and Sullivan. I basically work with organizations that need to look 10 years out and model what it'll be like to live in the future. Um, and I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do that and how I do that. But pretty much this is, yes, a very embarrassing picture of me of age 13. I don't think you can actually see what I'm doing with my hair in that picture. And that's a good thing because if you could see, you'd be happy I lost it. <laughs> because it is real, real bad. And my mom actually now, she's a retired IT specialist. This is what she does. She tries to find really embarrassing pictures of me. Normally when I go and I spend a lot of time talking to folks, um, I say there's one thing in this photo that which will tell you everything you need to know about me, and it's not the telescope. If you look very closely at my wrist, ladies and gentlemen, that's a calculator watch. Thus proving beyond a doubt that I am a nerd. I am an unabashed nerd and an unabashed geek. Um, my background is I'm an engineer and a designer by training. For about 15 years, I was the chief futurist at the Intel Corporation, designing the chips and how people would use the chips. Normally, when I get on stages like this, I do say this. I say I'm usually the biggest geek in the room. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not, not, not even going to front close. that. <laughs> So we were trying to figure out who should get up here with Brian, so I figured Brian's a big nerd, so I'm a big nerd also. Uh, and in fact, early on in life, I decided, me and my sister, we were going to take over the world. And so what did I do? I joined the Army. So I joined the Army, got lots of experiences, lots of education, ultimately got my PhD, and so now I'm a senior security researcher in a governmental think tank. Wait, wait, no, don't go. Yes, she's the one standing on top of the tank like this. And now I work in a tank. Now you work in a think tank, yeah. and your business is tanks. And that's pretty awesome, that's I pretty think. That's pretty awesome. I think that totally works. So let's talk about threat casting. Um, we can go to the next slide. So threat casting is a process so that we can look out 10 years 
model possible threats, and then turn around and look backwards. And I want to kind of give you an overview of how this process works. So the reason why we do 10 years is 10 years is too far. It's further the most product cycles, further the most um, administrations, uh, further the most economists will go. As we like to say, it's over the horizon. And you can see the light from it, and we know we need to move in that direction, not that direction, not that direction, not that direction. We can move in a certain direction, and then as we get closer, we tack to it. So threat casting, it's effects-based modeling. It's sort of saying, what is the effect of these things? And we first start, when we do this, and it, our first input is social science. So getting an understanding, a scientific understanding of people, right? Understanding the actors who were involved in all of this modeling and working with anthropologists and ethnographers to get that understanding. Then the next thing we do is we look at the technical research. So what will be possible 10 years from now? We have a pretty good understanding of sort of the technological capabilities and sort of science of what's coming down. Then the next step is we look at trends, and I'm not a big trend guy to tell you the truth. Oftentimes this is just the math of the future. This is GDP, population growth. But also, and we've used this actually in our research, we also use a lot of cultural history because history is the on-ramp to the future. Actually, history is the language that we use to talk about the future, not only in sort of society, but also in large organizations as well. We start to kind of embrace that past so that we can move forward into the future. What a lot of the historians that I work with will say, history doesn't repeat itself, it's just the language we use to talk about what's happening. And then the, the next step is we use something called data with an opinion. So the threat casting process really embraces the idea of kind of what Natalie was talking about earlier, that we all have a role to play. The future isn't fixed, right? It's not something out there that we're all running towards, helpless to do anything about. The future is built by people. It's built by organizations. It's built by folks like you. It's built by the military. It's built by government. So it's not, but it's, it's not fixed. And so what I do is we go out and talk to people. And we ask them, well, where do they see things going? And then as we bring all these things together, so the social science, the technical, the trends, we go and talk to experts. And then we use a little bit of science fiction, science fiction based on science fact, to think about possible futures. It's one of the things that I do work with a lot of sort of science fiction folks like Cory Doctorow and Charlie Strauss, those guys thinking about what it might look like. It then gets us to say, okay, well, what is this vision for the future? What are these possible threats? And what are both the positive and negative outcomes? And the reason why we do that is we start these models so that we can turn around and look backwards. Right, so then we want to backcast. We want to look backwards. And so if we know what we want the future to look like in 2026, what do we need to start doing in 2019? And if we want to be there in 2019, ultimately, what do we need to start doing today? Literally today, what should all of us be doing Sunday afternoon when we walk out of ShmooCon to ensure that the path we're traveling is towards the positive futures we envision and not so close to the negative futures? And so what happens in this is two things kind of pop up that's really cool as we do this backcasting. And the first thing are gates. And gates are things that organizations and people can control. And maybe those are things that we choose to fund or things that we choose not to fund or ways that we train people. But these are things that we can have control on, on the path to the future. But even more interesting are these things called flags. And these are the events and things that happen that we have absolutely no control over. And more importantly, when they happen, there is absolutely no going back. And we are going to be on that path. And so the fact is, is that uh, we ran this in August as an experiment. And many of the flags we came up with have already started to come about. But it's OK, because we've thought through this now, and we've gone through this process, and we have some ideas about what we can do to put us on the path that we want to be. Because in essence, what we have are events. And when we sat down and we imagined these grandiose futures, we took a person in a place doing a thing that's living in this constructed future that we have. And now from there, we can model the threats and what's going on. And we can come up with plans and ideas of how to disrupt and mitigate. And if we can't at least recover from the threat that's happening to this person in a place doing a thing. And now we have this ability to have a 10-year plan where we've got some gates and we've got some flags and we've got ideas of what we can do when this future turns around and happens. And we're absolutely not claiming to have 100% knowledge of the future, right? Because if we knew 100% what the future looked like, I would not be standing on the stage. I would be walking to the cornerstone and buying a Powerball ticket for tonight's drawing. That's what I'd be doing. But instead, what we're saying is we have this framework of how to bring in all these multidisciplinary inputs to come up with a transparent plan so when something happens, we know how we can react and we can be prepared for it. And what if some of these inputs change 
it's okay because we can just dump in the new input, turn the crank, and look at where that future has changed. And hopefully, if it's a positive future, we're moving towards it, and if it's a negative future, it's gonna take us longer to get there. And so one of the things about this process, and as like Natalie said, it's, it's a framework, right? It certainly it is a process, and we, we did this process earlier, which we're gonna to talk to you about in a moment. So we not only did the process, but now it's a framework. It's a contextual framework for taking in disparate information, processing it, and then coming up with some possible actions. But the thing that I tell my students and the thing that we really embrace, and again, one of the main reasons why we're here is that our goal, now that we've built this, is to bust it. So our goal in this process, as Natalie said, isn't to be right. It isn't to say, well, we've now done this research and this is what we say and now we're right and everything's great. It doesn't work like that. Right? The future doesn't work like that. The idea that we're trying to get to is to get it right. right? That's what we're trying to do is to actually secure people and secure organizations. And that's what this process is there to allow us to do. And what I tell my students all the time, she or he who breaks the model first wins. Because if you can break the model, you fix it first. And that's one of the things you'll see constantly coming up where we want to ask you questions as well, is we always want to find more disparate information. We want to find those dark areas that we're not talking about. And as we start to talk through our results, if you go, wait, 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 you guys missed this. Awesome, thank you, that's what we need. Because what makes this most robust is the more disparate the inputs, the stronger the model itself. And that's really our approach to the, of what threat casting is all about. And so that's all well and good that we've presented this conceptual model, but we've actually tested it out and run an experiment. And so we ran a pilot effort in August, and so now we're gonna share kind of how it went, what resulted, and what we're doing about it now. And so a good way to start any collaborative effort is to collaborate. So this is just a smattering of the logos of the folks that attended, a mixture of academia, industry, government, and the military. But you know what? We were missing you. And that's a problem. So over the course of two days, we had 28 participants that we got together. In small groups, we crafted 14 different visions of potential futures of 2026. And the power of threat casting is not in getting any one specific future, right? But it's in the aggregate of all these ideas. And so as we curated this process, we wanted to be also very transparent about those inputs. So you remember, you've got the social, the technical, the trends, all those inputs. Well, you have to pick it. I was talking earlier with some, some folks who, who showed up that we realize that you can't solve all the problems, right? If you try to boil the ocean, it's a fool's game. We're not trying to find everything. So how you actually constrain it is you curate the inputs. And so when we did this um, early, when we did it last year, what we did is we actually really focused on specific areas. We focused on complex automated systems, certainly with auto artificial intelligence. We looked at um, supply chain, because supply chain certainly is where the digital becomes physical. Um, and then we also looked at uh, tech and terrorism. Now, what this means is this allowed us to focus on a threat landscape that was very specific, knowing and embracing the fact that there's a whole bunch more, there's a whole bunch of other places we haven't looked that we need to look in the future. But so as we walk through our results here, we wanted to be, again, be very transparent that we went in beforehand knowing that we wanted to constrain it just so we could identify that specific area. And the goal here is as we move forward to identify some more of this. This is another area for your input that we really want either today or when we're at the con is if you've got other ideas saying, oh, you guys should really go investigate this. That's awesome. That's actually what we're looking for. So we're going to share one of the futures uh, that our, the participants came up with to kind of showcase how that then blends into the overarching results. Uh, so the year was 2026, and automation is completely pervasive. From clothing to appliances to self-driving vehicles, it sure seems that there's embedded computers everywhere. And so the benefits of this internet of everything are just taken for granted by most, if not all. And so we have Mike. Mike is a frontline supply chain supervisor working at a regional distribution center near the Port of Red Hook. And on this crisp autumn day in 2026, He'd normally kill time at work uh, by tracking the stocks, the couple stocks that he owns as they fluctuate throughout the day, because truly the artificial intelligence that's running this very complex logistical apparatus, well, makes for very boring days as a supervisor. But today, that's so not true, because the system seemed to be dealing with this sudden uptick in demand for perishable goods. And to Mike, it looks like everybody in the New York City metropolitan area all of a sudden ran out of milk. 
And all of their smart refrigerators seem to be driving the surge in requests for perishable goods. And so the supply chain system itself is expanding the area and looking for more and reassigning trucks to bring in all these supplies from desperate areas. Which means other things, like, I don't know, repair parts, are temporarily deprioritized so that way the company can maximize profits from this very unusual event. And that all seems good, but to Mike, this seems a little wonky. So he starts looking at it as his team. And, you know, because even though autom uh, autonomous vehicles is very commonplace in 2026, they're really expensive, and he's thinking about, well, what gets shoved off to the wayside because they're moving all this milk around the, the metropolitan area? So he's running diagnostics, and all of a sudden, a news feed catches his eye, and it seems there's something going on at the port. There's this backlog of containers coming off of shipment because some of the automatic scanners looking for um, hazardous material, nuclear hazardous material, seems to be down. And so the, the place is in an uproar. What are they going to do? And so they decide, what can they do? They have a backup plan, right? Their coop plan. They switch to manual inspection. But they can only look at a certain percentage of the containers coming in manually, so they have to let the rest go through. And it sure seems obvious to Mike, with this sudden uptick of perishable goods being routed around, there's no way those repair parts are going to get there anytime soon. But he shrugs. He goes back to his task at hand. Not important. And in fact, that ultimately ends up being the last task that Mike will ever perform, because a few hours later, a very unsuspected container coming from Krasnovia, loaded with a combination of high explosives and, and nuclear material, detonates prematurely a mile from his workplace. And this massive dirty bomb uh, misses the target of seven, several million people that was meant to be in the heart of, city, of the city, but still causes massive casualties, including Mike. And you know, shortly before he succumbed to radiation poisoning, Mike was finally able to connect the dots and realized that this uptick in the need for milk was truly meant to delay the repairs to the scanner and facilitate this delivery of the bomb. So for us, what this happens, right, what, would, what this is, this is a DDoS attack on a highly automated system, right? And so for us, it showed us how we moved from the sort of purely digital through into the kinetic. And so ultimately, how this came about. So what's going on behind the scenes? This is what threat casting um, really starts to uncover. So if this is what happens, if this is the experience, how the heck did that happen? Well, the first we know is that you have artificial intelligence not only going out and sort of taking care of this complex um, um, automated system, but you also have now have AI on the, the side of those who would want to do us wrong. And so now you have the AI watching the plane and watching what's going on, trying to find, constantly trying to find little gaps and little holes and little ways that it can actually bring down the system to create a hole. Oh, you did bring it forward. I didn't bring my glasses. You're terrible. So what happens, right? So now you've got all these wonderful Internet of Things, right? You've got all these smart refrigerators and these smart homes. Well, great. By the way, the Internet of Things, as most of you know, is about as secure as a sieve, right? It's about as secure as a piece of paper that's got lots of holes in it, right? So because we're not, they're shipping it not because they want it to make it secure. They're shipping it to ship it, right? That's what they get rewarded for. Well, now you can start putting a little bit of malware. You can put a little... Um, 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 software on there that allows to say, well, instead of ordering the milk on Friday, order, uh, order the milk on Tuesday, right? So when you're there, you're like, oh, well, great, my smart refrigerator just knows for some reason that I might need it a little bit earlier. But when you have an entire city or an entire region doing this, right, the single person on the ground who's right in the middle will never notice it. But in the aggregate, it actually starts to create a big, big hole. What this starts to reveal, which we'll get into later, is this notion that efficiency is easy to hack. As everybody knows, it's all about what you're optimizing for. So what are you optimizing for? And most of the time, in the Internet of Things and in most business, the world that I come from, we optimize for efficiency. Efficiency is the god, right? And so the more efficient, the better. Well, if we know that these systems are optimizing for efficiency, you can hack it. Right? You can totally go through and hack it, which is what happened here. Is they started saying, let's actually take that efficiency and use that against it. And now what that means is that because you have this flooding of the goods, it starts to take those scanners down. So as Natalie sort of mentioned, you have all of this, you have all the pressure coming, that all these goods and all these services, and right, it's all about efficiency, it's not about security. And what it means is the scanners at the port start to go down. We can't get the um, uh, replacement parts because they have the, um, because you have the milk and the perishable goods going through. It creates a physical vulnerability. 
So now we've moved from sort of data only and all these different individual, almost micro-targeted attacks on all the Internet of Things and what it's done in the physical world, it's opened up a hole. And what that hole then allows for is to bring in a kinetic attack. And for us, this really illustrated uh, this widening attack plane, which is sort of the title of our talk today, is that when you look at this world, and, and this world, for most of you, will not be surprising. What we can tell you is as we've gone out and started reporting this out at a couple different conferences, and as we do this more, for a lot of people, this freaks the freak out for people. I'm trying to be, say, polite. I know this is MooCon, but I'm trying to be polite because my mom said I'm not allowed to cuss on stage. It really freaks people out. Um, and so what we're trying to do is use this as a model to say this is what it will actually feel like to live in the future and then what brought it about and what do we do about it. So this then gave us a framework as a way of thinking about the, the attack plane. So as we mentioned before, this illustrates that we go from not only just digital, but we move to the micro-targeted, so the ability via social networking and via the Internet of Things to actually target a single person or a single family. Um, and artificial intelligence allowing it to spoof it or take it over or do influence, and then to move to the physical world, right? To, and when you have complex automated systems, you've got these supply chains to actually disrupt the physical world, which we're already beginning to see happen, and then finally opening up an area for kinetic attack. And as we look out 10 years, what we're beginning to see are more and more blended attacks. We're not just talking about digital or data-only attacks. What we're starting to see is this is only a single component, so the notion of sort of digital security or infosec and all of that, no. As we all know that this is simply becoming just another tool, sort of in somebody's toolbox to actually perpetrate an attack. So what threat casting in our report allowed us to say is, well, let's break this up and find out in this whole terrain who's responsible, like what could actually happen. So in the first area, you've got this sort of digital only, and this is kind of what we know. This is breaches, this is intellectual property, this is hack and release, these are things that we've seen. And these are things that as we were working, doing the research when it comes to the army or the military, that this is sort of very traditional. But this is such a very small part of the attack plane. The next area that you look at, which I think makes most people really uncomfortable, and we, and I, myself included, I think, are woefully lacking in our conversation with the general public. Because if you can start to have micro-targeting, it means that every single individual needs to have an understanding of what's going on and what they can do. And unfortunately, we've pretty much given people, um, we've disempowered people because we scare the heck out of them and they feel like they can't do anything. And then the next area that we looked at, which is probably, for me, one of the ones that's most interesting, is the, the role that private industry has to play. Again, this is the world that I come from, this is the, the side of the research that I come from, is to say, private industry actually has a much larger role to play than it already is doing. But as I've gone out and started working with folks and working with companies, and we've been talking about this, they don't actually know what to do. Especially they want to secure, you know, security is good for business, right? Not being hacked and certainly kinetic attacks are bad for business. But that idea that we need to empower people to do it. And then finally, what we um, started to uh, really model is when you have something that goes from data to social to physical to kinetic, we actually do have apparatuses in place with, with the Army and the military working with um, corporations to actually secure that part of the attack plane. And so what we came up with four big takeaways from that research that we did in August. Uh, the first two are real big threat areas, and the second two are action areas, what we need to do. And I mean, these threat areas seem very common sense to all of us in this room. But they're not common sense, as Brian said, to the C-suite and the 99% of the rest of the world's population that don't look like us and don't think like us. And so by crafting this framework and creating these stories, a person in a place doing a thing, we're able to dialogue and speak the language that uh, the rest of the world sort of understands to get them to understand what we already know to be true. So real briefly, as we already mentioned, these two threat areas. The first is in the next 10 years, we see this weaponization of data itself, where data itself isn't truly the weapon to spoof or obfuscate or hijack systems. Because increasingly, these systems that we're going to use to process information and turn information into insights and then ultimately take autonomous action without us, well, they rely on really complex algorithms to sift through massive amounts of data and this is only going to continue. And if we can no longer trust the data that goes into these systems that then force a decision, and if we don't have the ability as we design these systems to be able to query them, to ask them, why did you make that decision? It makes no sense to me. 
uh, then we do truly have a problem because these machines will start to act virtually independently. And this weaponization of the data means that attackers now maybe don't have to attack the system, they just have to attack the data, which will not only increase the fog of war, but to be able to manipulate the reality or how these machines view reality and how then the systems reflect reality back and, to and us. And that's where I have to chime in. So, yes. so okay. this, this idea of this sort of assault or, or war on reality, and most of you know this, but I really want to call it out because it's something that as we've started presenting this out to folks, it is a, a very real possibility. So as we know, when you're dealing with complex automated systems, autonomy and land, sea and air, as well as with AI, the only input is data. So if you're able to spoof the data, if you can weaponize data, what that means is if you can ma manipulate the data that comes into these complex automated systems and you do it correctly, you can literally construct a reality that is different than the reality that we're living in. So literally you have, you could have a complex automated system, a, a supply chain system, a delivery system, you name it, that literally its concept of the world is fundamentally different than the concept of the capital R reality. And as we start seeing this more and more and more, this becomes a very real threat and a very true threat that we actually start to have a massive delta or a massive schism between the realities that live on these systems. And not just this, like for instance, Wednesday. Wednesday I was teaching my class and I gave a fact, I asked my students a question. They didn't know the answer, so I told it to them. And I continue on with the conversation. And a minute later, one of them raises their hand and I'm like, yes. They're like, ma'am, you were right. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I have my PhD, been doing this for a while. I'm glad you think I'm right. Why do you think I'm right now? Wikipedia, ma'am. Wikipedia just confirmed you were right. And that's their reality now. It's not me and my experience talking to them. It's reality. Wikipedia, thank gosh, <laughs> told me I was right. I now can sleep well at night. But um, so the second threat area that we really found during modeling all these futures in August was this direct desire of our result in life to produce more and more efficient systems, right? So whether you're looking at market forces or whether you're looking at business management, everybody rewards efficiency. Whether you get this efficiency by cutting costs or increasing production, this is valued over everything. And so that means is that we get rewarded for putting our product out at the door and definitely not for security, definitely not for quality, and definitely not for robustness to be able to be handled. Yeah, and it's one of the things in the, in the world that I come from in Silicon Valley. I mean, that's where funding comes from. That's where everything is sort of judged by shipping, shipping and efficiency and getting it out the door. And it's not actually valued in um, the, the, the actual security of the system and the effect of the system. Now, it should be said, in these two threats that, that we've sort of modeled, these are aggregated. You know, certainly as, as we release the report and we release more of the research, you'll see all of the different um, futures that we've modeled all kind of sit under here. And they're basically different versions of this reality. And the, as Natalie said in the beginning, the power of threat casting doesn't come in sort of finding a single threat or a single thing or a single future. It's in the aggregate. It's being able to look at it using the same process, using the same data, and being able to Im imagine it from um, many different factors and many different viewpoints to give us an idea of action. And that's really the, the, the two pieces down here at the end to say, well, what are the actions that we should take? Right? That's ultimately what threat casting is all about. It's not just modeling the futures. The reason why we're modeling these futures is to say, what do we do? What do we start getting done? And the first area that we called out was this notion that we, there's a need for new norms. So when it comes to this, the constellation of people who will be actors in this widening attack plane, that it's, we know that there's broader and broader people, that it's not just military, it's not just federal, it's not just private citizens and corporations and education. Everybody has a role to play in this. And indeed, from a domain and an ethics and a legal expertise, it's spread all the way across. And what we lack are norms. What we lack are ways for people to know what action they can take. From the private sector, what are people allowed to do? What's, what's okay, what's not okay? And I don't mean from a regulation standpoint. I don't actually even mean from a legal standpoint. I mean, we don't even actually have a language. In my world, it's not even like the technological standards. We all know about technological standards. But even walk that back a bit further, 
And you can just say, we all know that oftentimes you don't have to turn something into a technical standard. You just have a norm. It's just the way we all do it. And the, that, the reason why we do it is because it's the right way to do it and we need to do it so that we can actually get more done. And we don't even have that. We don't even have that dialogue going on between people. So we certainly need that. We certainly need the rules of engagement, the rules of com communication. Like, what does that look like? And what is that conversation like between all these different actors? And then the, the final part is much more of this, this outreach to the general public. I think everybody here knows that the reality that we are living in, that's why you're here. But you go outside of this room, you go outside of this sector, and you start talking to people, they don't live in this reality. They live in a very different reality. It's not their fault. It's not what they do. It's not they're, they're not actually been given the information. But we do need to embrace the fact, and certainly the past year and the past several years have shown this, that we are living in a new reality when it comes to security. And we need to have this dialogue. And, and again, as a, as a futurist, I fault myself oftentimes, because oftentimes when we give people a map of the future, we give them two extremes, right? It's either, um, it's either Tuesday or it's doomsday, right? Either everything's okay or we're all going to hell. Right? We don't actually get into the reality, and what we've found as I've, we've gone out and started talking to people about this, just average folks, is that you, you, you pull away people's agency. You disempower them if we basically talk about the apocalypse all the time. And we need to actually give people the tools and the conversation and the ability to have this dialogue and to do it over a sustained period of time, and it's one of the things that we, we sorely lack. So now that we've created this framework of how to understand these threats, what we realize is we have to bring a ton of different people in to have these conversations. So what we've done is so far is just version 1.1. And so we're trying to figure out how to do our part and help others do their parts to ultimately minimize the strategic surprise in this domain. Right? So I just I threw some army speak in there right there. Strategic surprise. She got, she got all, all, all it's army totally idea. what we're trying to do. Okay, so this is not just a one-off idea, right? This isn't a wacky thing that we came up with. We did in August. Woohoo! We finally had a topic cool enough to talk at ShmooCon about. Um, so we actually, as we started presenting our initial uh, report out on this, we were asked by industry professionals and we were asked by generals in the military once they saw what we had, strongly encouraged us to keep this going. And that's to take it to the next step they challenged us to figure out not how to do this just once as an experiment, but to come up with a formalized way to do it uh, over a much longer time period. And so that's what we're looking to do for the next five years. Uh, we're committed to spend exploring different aspects of the future with a bunch of different folks. And to do that, we're actually launching a lab at Arizona State University, a threat casting lab, where we're going to encourage and sponsor research both by undergraduates and graduate students around the country to looking at these flags that we come up with and these gates and help us figure out, well, what would we need to do? Whether that's something that government needs to do, whether that's something the military needs to do, that's something industry needs to do, that's something that just the individual citizen needs to do, to help us to get to the more happy futures and further away from the so not so happy futures. So what we're also gonna do is we're gonna gather twice a year uh, in these threat casting workshops with a different subset of curated inputs with hopefully a very broad spectrum of an audience to think through crafting what these futures are. And it'd be nice, right, because I'm on the East Coast and he's on the West Coast, we're gonna flip flop uh, where they are to make it easier for folks to travel and to participate. And so what we're missing is you. But you know, this isn't just, hey, come hang out with us for two days, think about the future, it'll be rad, you know, maybe you can claim it as a business expense. Like, it's more than that. Because as much as thinking is important, right, and as an academic at times, it's all about the thinking, and that's important, but it's even greater than thinking is the doing. And so what we're looking for is participants that want to help us think through this idea, but then pledge that they're going to go out and do something. So when it's done and we've done the workshop, you are empowered and you go home and you start with your slice of friends, with yourself and your slice of friends, about starting to make a difference to help us change the world. And that's what we're trying to pull together is to make sure that we have the right people in the room, both literally and figuratively, so that not only are we doing the correct modeling and doing the rigor and actually having the detail that we need, but then so that we're filling the room with people who can take action. Whether that be an industry, we're gonna be working with trade associations who are actually training 
in certifying the next generation of security professionals. We're going to be certainly working both on the academic side with the service academies as well as in academia to actually go and start teaching this and start getting it into the curriculum. We're also going to be working with uh, the feds. So we're sort of saying how do they kind of pull this off and do it. The idea being that everybody who comes as Natalie said, we don't want you to just come and be there and be smart and go home. The idea is if you're going to show up, you've got to do something with it. And that's everybody who we've talked to, and as we've gone off and started socializing this idea, that's what we want. We're like, come, give us your ideas, give us some things, but then go and take this, because as we said, all the results are going to be open to the public. Now go do something with it. And sometimes it could be taking it into your business, sometimes it could be doing research, sometimes it could be taking it behind closed doors and doing what you do in your company or group. Awesome. But again, the whole goal here is not to be right, the whole goal is to get it right. And we see over the next five years that this is a way that we can create it, and if we're not getting it right or doing it right, or if you want to get access to people who you're not getting access to, that's one of the things, that's what the, the Threat Casting Lab is there for, is a way to convene and connect these people. So what can you do? Oh, hey, here's what we're gonna do. So we're setting up a Threat Casting Lab. Um, and so it's a threat casting lab. We're still trying to come up with a really cool name, so we, we need a really cool term. If anybody's got another term for what to call our workshops, workshop sounds just so kind of boring. It's like, oh, it's a workshop. What's that? Throw down. Throw down. Oh, there, that's a good yeah. one. I mean, that, that's a good alliteration, right? TNT, but. Uh... Lifeboat. There we go. Ooh, I kind of like that one. We do, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, maybe it can like it can it can flip. <laughs> like we'll just actually have a, a constant feed where people can actually kind of put it in. So what are we doing? Is um, we're going to do it at Arizona State. We're setting up a threat casting lab. I said I'm the um, futurist in residence at ASU. The reason why we did it at ASU, just as a, a, a full disclaimer, is because we wanted to bring together so many disparate players. We wanted to do it at a large public university because again, it's held to a much higher um, bar of transparency of what's going on. And if anybody wants to know where the data is gonna live and what we're gonna do with it, we can tell you all of that because I can tell you certainly we have to do that work because it's at a public university. Um, but we wanted to kind of set it there. Also, as you said, because we've got um, Natalie at West Point on the West Coast, we're out in Arizona. I can tell you there's some times of the year, Arizona's a really good place to come and visit. I'm just saying, it's very nice. Um, so what we are going to do is on May 1st and 2nd, so mark your calendars now. May 1st and 2nd is when the next threat casting throwdown, threat casting lifeboat, threat casting... Anybody? No, nobody? Event. What was that? Event. Event. Well, okay. Eh, throwdown and lifeboat, much better. Anyway, so, <laughs> by the way, tonight at the bar, hopefully everybody comes up and can be like, dude, I got an idea. Because um, everybody gets brilliant in the bar, just so you know. Um, I, mean, I, I do some of my best thinking while drinking, so I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. expecting great ideas to come out tonight from each and every one of you. So the idea is um, to come together May 1st and 2nd, um, and we're going to do a two-day workshop um, and bring everybody together. Again, we're looking for between 30 and 60 participants, again, that are going to span all across public, private, EDU, feds, you sort of name it. Um, we're going to get everybody together. and. Um, this is where we need you. This is where we need your help. Uh, so number one, take a picture. I had a couple of people who had said, how do, how do we find out more? If, you, if you're just interested in it, if you just want to be kept on, um, informed, great, tell us. If you uh, want to come, please, awesome, tell us. Um, if you want to be a part of it, but you can't come in May because we're going to do another one on the East Coast, probably we're thinking September, October mm -hmm. time frame. And we'll announce that sooner than later because we want to get on everybody's schedule. Um, or if you've got ideas, again, not only ideas for awesome names that make us sound cool, but also uh, topics, curator topics, things we need to look at, problems, research inputs, people we need to talk to, any of that, please go ahead and email us there. So our initial thought, right, we're trying to think what are our three to four top curated inputs we'll talk about in May. So we've got two so far, but they're totally open to your ideas, especially if you think we've got them wrong. So talking to folks, uh, I went out in the world and I talked to Weaver, I was chatting with him last month, and so he thinks we should focus on complexity of code. And look at this idea as we allow machines to start writing the code themselves 10 years in the future. At what point does it get too complex that we don't understand what's going on or able to troubleshoot it? Or separately, right? We have some code that we start and was written in one language, and then, oh, it's got to be updated, and it gets wrapped around some other language, wrapped around some other thing, wrapped around some other thing. And at what point do we truly not understand what that original code do does? 
Um, so is this going to be a problem in the future as code gets more and more complex compared to our understanding of it? Another idea that was given to us by some generals in the military was this idea about intelligence, intelligence data collecting and analysis and being able to do that at machine speed to make uh, decisions. But more importantly, what happens when intelligence is no longer covert? What if when there's so many sensors and everything out, is there some point in the future that just you can't do it anymore? Whether it's from a military or a government or a business perspective, at some point, does this become a problem? And so plus, we're open to ideas. We want to know what are those scary things that you envision happening in the future, 10 years in the future, that you don't think specifically other people are paying enough attention to. And those are kind of the threads that we want to pull out in these workshops workshop slash lifeboats slash throw down throw down slash events slash please give us a really cool name for these things and so we've got a few minutes left so we purposely went a little bit short because we really want to hear from you we want to know what your questions are specifically i want to know what are we doing that you think is just so totally wrong because that's going to help us get better so i just want to thank you very much for all your advice and your comments in advance and we're here to answer your questions and oh by the way we played paper rock scissors before this began and i lost which is why i was flipping slides which means he gets to answer all the really hard questions because he won she's right she's right also we're here we're here for the whole con so again please track us down certainly in the bar tonight if you've got ideas or more questions but yeah if anybody has any ideas anybody has any questions or just questions about the process i'd love to nerd out and tell you more about it the gentleman has his hand there and then there's a lady right there so i will repeat your question but yell really loud so how do your predictions 10 years ago stack up today uh, about 98% thanks so the question was, you have to repeat oh, I'm the sorry. question. So he said, how do our predictions 10 years ago stack up against today? And my response is, about 98%. Good job. So the, the essence is we just started this in August, so we don't have to go real well. Now, if we look at what his future, how well he's been able to predict the future in the past, well, just I would say take a look at Intel stock, but, you know. That's me. Well, and, but to, to, to not be so flippant. So um, I can actually show you. Uh, so I have always been held to this bar of transparency, right? You can't just say it's a black box and this would no, no, you don't do that. Especially when you're designing a chip 10 years out or designing technologies, you better get it right. So ultimately, it's not about this prediction, saying this one thing. Ultimately, what I do as a futurist and what we're trying to do as future casting, again, is creating that range to say we roughly move in this direction. And then as you're building the technologies or the businesses, you tack. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is give the people that we're working with, and what I do is give the organizations that I work with information, just enough information so they can make decisions today, but knowing that there's a, a wide um, area of uncertainty, which isn't a bad thing, but so be able to take direction through that uncertainty. But to come back around, um, I wrote a book back in 2006, 2007 called Screen Future about the far off future of the year 2015. Um, and actually, my students like to analyze it. And what they'll tell you, it's about 96%. Uh, but again, it's not a prediction. It's generally a, a, a broader picture. Right here. So the question is, we have a process, and is the process sort of very people-driven, or is this, or there some software that's behind it? So what I can tell you is that right now, it's mainly a process for collaboration, and most of it is actually just done through working through the data, coding the data, and just like you would do a lot of research when it comes to coding or doing things in Excel, it looks like that, but it's not a highly automated process, because a lot of it actually has to do with people talking to each other and people working with each other. And I will say that is some future is where we're going to, right? With this ability of setting up the lab and being able to sponsor research by grad students and by undergrads. Like these are some of the things we'd like them to be able to do is craft a system that will go out and scrape information on what's going on in society to help us realize when we hit these flags or when these gates are occurring to help us. So eventually, yes, right now it's so much more manual than anything else. And it's actually being used, and then we'll go to you and go to you. We still got five minutes. Um, it's also being used as a requirements document to do that. So now that we've identified different areas on that attack plane, now we can actually go and do some scraping. And we can do that type of stuff. And also one of the things we didn't mention though, which will be happening in parallel because we both work for organizations, um, is we're also gonna be creating teaching. 
We're going to create tools so that we can now start to train the trainers. So as we do this, we're rigorously documenting the process. And by about two years into our five-year run, we're going to start teaching it. So it'll be taught at West Point, at the US Air Force Academy, also at ASU. So we're actually going to make sure that it's sort of self-propagating. Gentleman right there. So the question is, are we aware of the Foundation series from Isaac Asimov? Yeah. <laughs> what part of Calculator Watch didn't you see? <laughs> I think I, I, I teethed on that book. Yeah, no, exactly. Yes, sir. So the question is, in, on the social side, right, it's all about people, and certainly security is all about people, and the question being, as we look at the different generations, do we have an understanding of what the next generation that's coming up? Um, so the, the short answer to that is uh, yes. One is you, you have social scientists who are, they're scientists, so they're trained and they're already studying those, to the fact that it's ethically okay. The other part is I spend a lot of time in schools. I spend a lot of time in not just universities, sort of talking and working with that next generation. One of the things, certainly as a part of this process, what we're making sure that we do, that when we do this threat casting, this modeling, we're involving that next generation where, to the level that it's appropriate. So that again, much like we're gonna teach them, that we're also starting to get their input. And I will say yes, because we are working with a couple independent researchers in academia that are looking specifically at that. What is this next rotation of a generation going to look like and how are their values, how have they been shaped differently and therefore how do we need to change um, as they come up and become more and more of our workforce. So we are doing some research on the side and then incorporating them into this process. And we're going to take one more question from, from here in the front, but one of the things I'll also tell you that as a, as a futurist and as sort of a corporate sort of working futurist, what I tell every CEO, every C-suite when they say, how do I prepare for the future? I say get a 13-year-old mentor that everybody should have a 13-year-old mentor because they're awesome. They've got one foot in still being a kid, but another foot in the adulthood, and they don't care anything about what you think, and they will tell you that you're an idiot, and that's what you need, which is really cool. So the question is, we've talked about different ways of being able to get this out there, have a broader conversation, having security um, literacy for folks who are coming up and, and in education. But the question is, well, what do we do with folks right now, people who are doing stuff? And you also said in power, so I also heard, so also for folks, because we are in DC, sort of in power, capital P power, what do we do? Um, well, one of it is to start a dialogue. So to get into the press, to get out there and actually start talking about it um, and start that dialogue, I think, is one area. And again, to get really pragmatic about it, again, not be super salacious. And then the other part with the, on the power side of it is the people who we're inviting to be a part of this as well are folks who do go and talk to Congress, are folks who do go and it's a part of their charter to actually brief the Congress on foresight. So trying to create a literacy and a conversation around this that again, that's why we picked five years, is that it's ongoing. It's not just here's one report, here's one thing. It's here we are and we'll be back in six months. Oh, and by the way, we'll be back in another six months. Oh, and by the way, we'll be back in another six months and we're going to bring a boatload of students with us. And that's that idea. Yeah. And I will say specifically, two of the, the futures that were modeled specifically looked and focused on that. So we can definitely talk about it afterwards. And more importantly, so we're publishing what our final results were from this experiment we did in August. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning about uh, learning more, if you want to see our website as soon as Brian gets off his stuff and sets up the website. Um, we're going to have a website, but until then, you can shoot us a note at this email address. Uh, we'll keep you in the loop, and specifically, if you have any really great ideas on what we need to be focused on, on what we should call our sessions so they seem hip and cool and cool people want to come, uh, and more importantly, if you want to be a participant and help us move the ball forward, we'd love to hear from, a, from you. Email us at this address or see us the whole time. We'll be here. Thank you so very much. Yep, and we're going to get off the stage to let the other folks up. And we just want to say thank you so much for coming out early in the morning. Thank you so much for ShmooCon for having us. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.